everyone. This is Jan Kabili with a brand new episode of The Fix, the podcast that's all about Photoshop, Lightroom, and post-processing. Tonight, our topic is shooting and processing photos of the stars. How exciting is that? And my special guest to talk about that topic is David Marks. David Marks is an outdoor photographer. He is a landscape photographer. He's an instructor. And he's the type of guy that thinks it's really fun to stay outside until 4 a.m. shooting the stars. Right, David? Oh, that's totally true. I, I absolutely love what the camera can see at night. I know you do. And you have worked out some terrific methods for getting great shots of the stars, both what you call pinpoint star shots and star trails and other, other techniques too. And I'm so excited for you to share those with us tonight. Tell us about what you're going to be showing us. All right. Uh, well, well, thank you. I, I appreciate the, the, the praise very much for my images. And, and um, I really, I love this topic. It's so much fun to me. I just am so amazed at what these cameras can see uh, that either my eye can't see or that, um, that you know, most folks, they shoot their photos from sunrise to sunset and then they call it a day and they go to bed or they go have dinner and that's the end of their photographic day. But there's so much beauty in the night sky and in landscapes at night. I just love, I love what, uh, what, what we're capable of doing. So today I thought I would talk about uh, the, the foundation, the building block, and that's pinpoint, crisp, sharp photos of the stars at night. Once we have those skills, then we can talk about making those really cool uh, arcs, the star trails kind of photo, where uh, basically we're dragging the shutter or we're combining frames together to create the swirling effect uh, out of our night sky. Oh, that's exciting. And then will you show us how to process those photos too? I'd be happy to. Terrific. Okay, so let's just jump right in and get started because I know you have a lot to cover and we want to see it. All right, let's see what I can do here. Um, As you're sharing your screen, um, I'll just uh, remind you that we have a bunch of listeners out there who can't necessarily see what we're doing. They can just hear us because they're listening as they're driving to work or, uh, you know, maybe while they're doing housework or something else. So um, be sure to make it so that they can understand it too, please. I will do my best. Uh, let's see. Uh, to get started here, um, I think that night photography, or I should say star photography, uh, basically, to be clear, there are two types of photos. There are pinpoint photos, those where the night sky is a frozen, you know, the stars are crisp little dots with no arc or streak. To shoot those, we're going to use a relatively fast shutter speed, something in the seconds range and a high ISO. And then there are the arcing swirling shots. Now, traditionally, we have shot those with very slow shutter speeds, something measured in minutes or hours at a much lower ISO. And so, uh, Example of pinpoint stars here, this is uh, Grand Canyon National Park, uh, big Milky Way rising up uh, above the, the black cliff walls at night. Uh, this would be an example of the star arc thing, where we have you know, the swirling sort of record player looking uh, pinwheel of stars around Polaris, around the, the North Star, at least in our hemisphere, the, the North Star. So for comparison, the pinpoint stars something like 20 seconds at a ridiculous ISO, 12,800, 6,400 ISO, something really high. The star trails, 30 minutes, but at ISO 200 or 400. Um, so the biggest problem people run into at night, the, the very first topic uh, for the day is how to focus. And, and here, I've got to say, nobody wants to see your blurry night photos. Right, because the blurry ones, the stars are just fuzzy little blobs. We want them sharp. And so we gotta focus. It's, it's gotta be crisp for what we're gonna do. And what you'll discover is that your autofocus does not work well at night. I'm sure most of our most of the listeners have tried this. When it's dark, the autofocus just goes wah, 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 wah. It can't resolve an edge, so it just keeps searching. Likewise, manually focusing when it's pitch blackout is really hard. There's some light loss when you look through the eyepiece on your camera. It's not as bright as what you see when the camera isn't to your eye. And so it's really hard to manually focus and know you're getting it right. So the solution is not to focus at night. The solution is to cheat and focus long before it gets dark. And this causes so much confusion amongst people. But the thing is, focus on our camera lenses is all about distance. Your camera lens does not know anything about the time of day. In fact, 
And I guess I should be clear here. For our night photography, we're going to tend to use wide-angle lenses. And if you have a wide-angle lens with uh, internal focusing or a distance ring, um, that's very helpful for this. But basically, the distance ring, the idea on like an SLR, you know, 35 millimeter lens, is that the lens resolves light at one foot away, three feet away, five feet away, that as we spin that focusing ring, we're telling it make light from this distance nice and crisp, meaning uh, that you can focus on a distant object, let's call it the horizon, right now during the day. The distance between you and that horizon doesn't change from day to night. If you focus on something far away right now, it's still far away at one in the morning, two in the morning, three in the morning. So the trick here is to focus our wide angle lens long before it gets dark, then to, to, to set it to manual focus, not you know just the focus ring, so that it won't go changing on its own. And then I like to go one further and tape the focus down. And I'll, I'll literally, my, if you saw my camera right now, it's covered in tape. Now in warm weather, uh, gaffer's tape is my favorite because it peels off nice and clean. But I'm going to tape that, I'll show you in the next slide here, I'm going to tape the focal ring down so that it cannot pivot. So my lens is now a fixed focus lens, fixed at infinity, at something distant. And I can do that during the day, and then I can just wait for darkness. And as long as I don't push too hard and break the tape, uh, I know that come dark, my stars will already be crisp. They'll be I, in focus. Can I ask you a question? Please. Where do you focus? So just imagine some kind of a scene, because of course you can't see where the stars are during the day. You can't focus on the empty sky. Do you look for something on the horizon far away or something kind of mid-ground? Where do you focus? Well, since we're going to shoot our nighttime photos predominantly with wide-angle lenses, um, on most wide-angle lenses, here, let me just stop the screen share for just a second, because this is a great, great question. Um, uh, let me see if you can see, can you see my face and all again? Yes. Uh, oh, the presentation is so much nicer. Um, uh, <laughs> so on, on a wide-angle lens, we have a distance scale. And uh, so like, like, let me untape this one. So on this lens, the distance scale is measured, we'll say, in feet. And basically, when we get to about just past 10 feet on this ring, we get to what the camera manufacturers label infinity. Uh, basically, to a wide-angle lens, uh, there is a certain distance. It's not necessarily 10 feet, but 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet. Beyond that, the lens is all the way out. It's focused at what it considers a, quote, infinite distance. So my advice when you're trying to test your lenses to get ready for night is you focus on something 100 yards away. Uh, you know, basically, if it's further than you can throw a baseball, that's far enough. Well, that's so not very far for me. <laughs> that's not yeah. going to work. But on a wide-angle lens, like literally on this lens, 10 feet is the end of its focal scale. To this lens, everything beyond 10 feet is infinitely far. And that's the, that's the part that most people miss here, is that once you hit the infinity point on the lens, the true infinity focus, anything further is still at infinity. Right, and, right, exactly. So, but, so but how do you know when you're at that point? Could you show the lens again? Does it show you, for example, on your lens where that is? So on this lens, uh, on this lens, let's see if I can kind of hold this up to the webcam. Yeah, that's good. That's there good. we go. I don't know if it's readable. but Yeah, it is there's our infinity line. I see. Now, if you have a gorgeous lens that's, you know, precision made, you could just set it to infinity and trust it. This is not trustworthy. Um, uh, the only lenses I know like that are basically the Zeiss, you know, super high-end lenses. Okay. On my Canons, my, my, you know, Sigmas, etc. that infinity has this line because it's sloppy. It's not an exact infinity point. So you have to test it to find where does this lens really resolve the light on something, again, about 100 yards away. And anything further than 100 yards away is infinity plus one, which Got is it. still Got crisp. It. And that's, that's the biggest confusion in night photography, I think, is that people 
uh, don't understand that to the lens, like one star might be closer to Earth than another, but your eye doesn't see it. Neither does the camera. The camera doesn't care. Once we've maxed out on its focal infinity plane, everything is, is crisp. And, and the beautiful part of these wide angle lenses is that, uh, uh, that we don't have to go very far before we find that point. Uh, and then once we've found it, then we gently tape the lens down and we're ready to wait, wait for darkness. We're ready to go. Great, I understand. And of course, there are a number of lenses that don't have those markings on them anymore. They've it's simplified so our lives, making them more complicated in my view, because <laughs> I learned photography back when those the markings were there and I use them all the time. Uh, although again, that assumes that those markings are spot on accurate. Correct. Um, and, and you know, as much as I would love to say uh, they are, I don't believe it till I've tested it. Um, and the other, the other one I would add is I really like to you to play this game, you know, focusing before dark, using uh, live view on my camera, so I can zoom in on that distant thing, and manually focus and see that it's razor sharp. Then I'll shoot a photo and I'll look at the photo on the screen and see is it really crisp? Are the things beyond it really crisp? And if they're crisp during the day, they're still going to be crisp. The stars will be crisp, I should say, at night. Uh, so this is one where where the live view can really help you out. Uh, Great, got it. But we're going to focus. Uh, we're going to focus manually. Let's see if uh, we're going to focus manually. We're going to tape it down. Um, then uh, once we go out at night, we're ready to shoot. So a little example here, because I wasn't sure if we'd be stopping the screen share. This is a blurry photo. Uh, it's a photo of a friend's a beautiful house, and it's completely out of focus. And right now, I basically have on the distance ring. I have the lens set to focus about five feet away. And this is still an out of focus photo. But now I have the lens set to focus, say, 15 feet away. And now I have a still out of focus photo, but we're close. I'm at, say, 30 feet away. And here, razor sharp. And now I've tested that lens looking through the eyepiece using live view so that I know that this distant object, again, about, a, you know, about as far as I can throw something, is nice and sharp. Once it's sharp, I'll gently tape that ring down, and then I wait for darkness. And darkness looks like that, Ooh. right? Because the, the house didn't come any closer. The stars are further than the house. So once we're at infinity, everything beyond the infinity point on the lens is still sharp. So this is pinpoint stars. This would be star trails, the Ooh. same focusing technique, the same lens. All that's changed is I've slowed the shutter down. Um, from one shot to another. Another example, I'll show this photo again, or a better copy. This is uh, Old Faithful in Yellowstone National Park. I, I teach a workshop there in the winter. Uh, I love photographing Yellowstone. I love photographing Yellowstone at night. Um, but this one's completely out of focus. Eh, as proud as I might be of Old Faithful at night, this is not a winning photo because my stars are smeary little blobs. Uh, this is the photo I'm, I'm proud of, where the stars are pinpoint sharp dots. The difference, a lens where I had focused and taped in advance, and a lens that I threw on my camera and said, I think I can eyeball it at night, but no, I really can't. I can't do it well. Uh, so okay. David, in, the, in that picture, if you would go back, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think you focused on? What, you know, I'm still on this point of where is the focus location? Um, because as, you know you have to kind of guess. You said a hundred yards, or where you could throw a baseball. Where yeah. in this photo? Uh, in this one, I actually had turned around to face the old faithful visitor center long before dark, uh, because the building has nice crisp edges, has uh, architectural details that make it really easy for me to uh, to see when something is really sharp and when it isn't. Uh, it basically, there there's no point in trying to focus on a soft puff, puffy cloud. Right. It's not a crisp object. We want to focus on something like a building, a tree, a rock, something that has hard edges. I had done that earlier in the day. And I was, again, uh, you know, 100 yards from the building, not even that far, because these are wide angle lenses, a 24 millimeter lens. I had focused on the details in the building in manual focus. I had made sure that I was getting nice, crisp daytime photos. I had gently taped the lens down. And then I recompose, you know, then I waited for dark, recomposed, waited for Old Faithful, success. 
Great. And so that's good to know that you can recompose and even leave the thing you focused on out of the final frame. Oh, well, often I focus these lenses, um, often I focus two or three lenses and tape them down and put them back in my camera bag. Then I drive to my location. I decide which lens I want to use. Is it the 14 millimeter? Is it the 24 millimeter? Is it, the, you know, and I put the lens on the camera and because they're already taped at infinity, I know they're already in focus. Um, and in fact, uh, like this lens, you can't see it right now, but the lens that's on my camera, I haven't untaped this lens in, in a week. It's been focused at infinity uh, all, all, all week long. Uh, and, and, and until I feel like I've banged the lens enough to, to weaken the tape, it's going to stay there. And the reason not to just turn the lens all the way to the very end of its turning range is that, as you said, that may not be the best infinity place, right? That, you know, I would love to tell you that the lens is perfectly inscribed and that where the little infinity symbol is, is actually where it focuses at, quote, an infinite distance. But on, on all the lenses I own, that's not true. On all the lenses that I own, that infinity mark is close but not precise to where it needs to be. Got it. Um, okay. I will leave you alone about that. I think I understand that now. That's great. Uh, well, I, and I know some other photographers who, instead of taping their lenses down, will test this out. And then they'll take like a Sharpie or a paint pen and they'll paint on the little lens where the infinity point is. I prefer the tape because I can be sloppy in the dark that way and not worry about did I touch the lens? Did I make it pivot? Um, but by any method, we test, we tape, we get nice, crisp focus at night. Make sense? Yes, thank uh, you. All right. So then to shoot our pinpoint stars, and, and here I have a pinpoint star photo of the, uh, the Orion in the winter and, and the Pleiades uh, star cluster. Um, here's some stars over the Matterhorn. I'll show this one again oh, in, in a little while here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, pinpoint stars... We've got our lens focused. We're on a tripod. Now what are the right, say, settings? Well, I guess I should add, to do these right, the most important thing is a sturdy tripod because we're going to shoot images that are in the seconds, you know, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. If your tripod is wiggling, that's going to be a blurry photo. So the place to, to put your money, a good sturdy tripod. Everything else you can get by with. If you have a cable release or an intervalometer, something so you can trigger the camera without touching it, bonus, but not essential for these. Um, so for pinpoint stars, we basically just need a, a wide angle lens, a sturdy tripod. And the reason I like to teach these first is that these are the foundation for everything else, for time lapse, for amazing events like the Aurora. The pinpoint stars are my building block for the star trail type photo. They're where everything starts. And they're how I test that I have everything set up properly. Um, so the other great thing about pinpoint stars is we can dial in almost all of the settings on our camera long before dark. That almost every setting, with one exception, 99%, we can set up right now at uh, you know noon on a sunny day. We're going to set our camera to manual mode uh, because at night the you know aperture priority, shutter priority, they're not going to work well for you. This is a place where raw files are really helpful. That we're, we know that these files are going to need noise reduction, white balance exposure, so shoot in raw. Personally, I like to change the white balance on the camera to something around 3200 Kelvin. Something very blue. Now, I just said shoot in RAW, so I'm sure that some of your very sharp listeners are saying, what's the difference? The difference is that it looks better on the back of the camera when I'm out there photographing. If the daylight is set to, say, white balance or auto, when I'm photographing, my images look very yellow. Now, yes, I can fix that when I get home, but it's just weird to be standing around under the stars at night seeing a yellow image. So setting it to about 3,200 Kelvin, I think will help you in the field, even though you can fix it when you get home. Makes sense. Likewise, I'm going to say turn off the long exposure noise reduction 
for your pinpoint stars. The long exposure noise reduction being that mode on your camera where, say, you shoot a 10 second exposure, and then it takes another 10 seconds uh, before you can fire the camera again. So it's a 20 seconds between images. That's not going to help us in, in these photos. I'm going to turn off high, high ISO noise reduction, although on most cameras, RAW files disable that anyway. And then if you don't have a self timer or a cable release, uh, if you sorry, if you don't have a cable release or an intervalometer, turn on the self timer so that when you click the camera, it counts, you know, 10, 9, 8, and then it fires the, the camera. So it has a chance to stabilize, less wiggle on your tripod. And then my last bit of advice on the camera settings, uh, on these settings, general settings, is turn the brightness of your camera's LCD screen way, way down. If you don't, when you shoot a photo at night and then the LCD screen pops on, one, it's going to blind you. It's unbelievably bright. And two, everything looks great when it's the brightest thing in a dark background. So if you don't turn the screen brightness down, you'll think you're getting great images, but really they're terribly underexposed or overexposed. So I have two questions about Please. the list of uh, what you need. Okay. Uh, one is, why are you turning off those two noise reductions? Um, that's the first question. And the second question is, if you don't have a cable release, could you use like one of those apps like Trigger Trap um, on your uh, phone to be the cable, you know, the remote cable release? Uh, uh, here, let me, let me hop back out so you can see my face. Uh, uh, absolutely love the Trigger Trap, um, this guy here. And for those who don't know, Trigger Trap is this little cable that you buy. It runs, oh, uh, I think it's about $25. And then you plug it into your phone and it acts as a cable release. So you're basically just buying the adapter end that fits a Canon, a Nikon, a Sony. The app is free, but the app doesn't do you any good without the cable. So this is, say, $20 versus you know the fancier Canon cable release. Um, the reason I'm turning off the long exposure noise reduction and the high ISO noise reduction for this kind of photography, first, on most of the cameras, at least the Canons and Nikons, when you're shooting in RAW, the high ISO noise reduction is disabled automatically. Um, and on those that don't, and I have to be careful here because I'm going to generalize, the high ISO noise reduction is a blurring routine, and it tends to make your photos kind of smeary. And I think we can do better fighting the noise in Lightroom and Photoshop and other software down the road. The long exposure noise reduction, that's when the camera shoots one photo, then it drops the mirror, and it shoots a second photo that should be inky black. In essence, it's taking a photo like with the lens cap on. And what it then does is it compares the black image, what they call a dark slide, with the real photo. And where it finds the same dot, a red dot, a blue dot, it knows that's a false pixel, and it tries to cancel it out. It's a, it's a noise reduction routine where it compares what ought to be inky black because the mirror was down with what was captured, which is wonderful. And I love that for like my, you know, 20 minute exposures. But if you're shooting a five second exposure of the stars, and then it takes 10 seconds, because five seconds for the real photo, and five seconds for the dark slide, that's 10 seconds before you can use the camera. I think it just frustrates us in the field. And I think on most of our cameras these days, the difference in noise between five seconds, five seconds doesn't show much noise, not the kind of noise that dark slide cancels out. Uh, 30 minutes shows that kind of noise. But our sensors have just gotten so good that in the 30 second and under range, again, I'm going to generalize. I'm going to say, I don't think it helps you much. Got it. That's fantastic. And you know, what I love about you, David, is first, you understand this really technical stuff. But second, you simplify it so that everybody can understand it. Those were great answers, great explanations. Oh, Let's see what you. else. What, thank what you, thank next? you. Uh, what I was going to say is standing around in the dark is uh, working the camera in the dark is frustrating enough already. Uh, so the less things that make it harder, the better. Uh, so the key to exposure here is our histogram. And it's really easy to get the exposure wrong if all you look at is the image on your LCD screen at night. At night, for our pinpoint stars, we want the body of the histogram about the middle of the graph. So let me show a couple examples. This is a terribly underexposed 
pinpoint star image. Basically, for those who can see the screen, there is a black screen with a couple of faint white dots. It's terrible. And the reason it's terrible is my choice of settings, my you know, uh, exposure settings, didn't let in enough light or weren't the camera wasn't light sensitive enough, I should say. So this is a 20 second exposure at F2 at ISO 800. And it's terrible. So I increased the ISO. At 1600, which is twice as light sensitive, now we still see a pretty dark image, but we're beginning to make out some trees uh, before the stars, a foreground. At ISO 6400, now I have the Milky Way, I have a clear horizon line, I have some trees, and the body of the histogram is closer to the middle of the graph, the middle of the graph meaning medium gray. And so my histogram from frame to frame has really spread out to the right uh, to, to show that my image is getting brighter. And what I've done is raise the ISO to 6400. Now it's hard to believe, but if I keep raising the ISO, I can actually blow out my night sky. At the ridiculous ISO 256, no, 25,600, <laughs> 25,000 ISO, my night sky actually becomes white. Uh, I can completely blow it out. So we want a histogram that looks something about like this, around the middle of the graph. Now, some folks are gonna ask, well, why am I changing the ISO? So for a quick review here, there are three settings on the camera that control the, the brightness, the exposure. There's our shutter speed, our aperture, and our ISO. Now, let's take the aperture first. The aperture, uh, on a camera lens, the wider the opening in the lens, the what we call the bigger the aperture, although that's really confusing because that will be the smaller number. F2 is a bigger opening than F4. It's this whole fractional thing. Uh, one divided by two compared to one divided by four. The narrower the opening in your lens, the less light it brings in. And with our stars, we're, we're trying to get every bit of light that we can. They're so faint and so distant. So if we stop the lens down, we're just basically robbing ourselves of light we might have had. So we're generally going to use our widest aperture. Um, having said that, I need to make one little note here. On most camera lenses, the widest opening on the lens is not that great. It's not real sharp, not real crisp. Uh, on most of the lenses that I own, I would love to tell you that I always shoot them wide open at night, F2, but it turns out that often I need to click the lens one click or half a click, uh, you know, F2.8, F2 point something, to make it a little sharper. So try an experiment, shoot some photos wide open, and see, does your lens, do you like them? And if you don't, try clicking them down just a little bit, just half a stop, third of a stop. And so even though you have your aperture very wide, because you focused on infinity, you're going to have in focus everything from the stars to the mid-range house that you focused on, for example, in your photo of the house. As, as long as the house is already at, in say, infinity, as long as it is beyond, uh, say, 10 feet, 15 feet from the camera, five Got feet, Got um, depth of field is meaningless. And, and this is, again, like this is a great question, Jan, because so many photographers have been trained on this depth of field idea, F8, F16, F22, but that only matters when something is closer than infinity. Once we get to infinity, there is no depth of field. It's all infinity. So there is no difference in the depth of field between F2 and F8 uh, at that, you know, for something that distant uh, in, this, in this case. Um, so yeah, I'm basically going to shoot wide open because I don't need to stop down. I would just cost myself light. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open my lens up. Basically, it's widest setting. Then my shutter speed, here's the tricky part. If my shutter speed is very slow, and I apologize, the little graphic here uh, is missing, but if my shutter speed is really slow, my stars will streak or blur. My shutter speed has to be fast enough to keep the, the stars uh, as pinpoints. And so there's this, quote, rule called the 500 rule. 
And it, again, I, I should say on this one, it assumes you're using a 35 millimeter uh, SLR type camera, and it assumes that you're using a full frame camera. But the math rule says take 500, divide it by the length of your lens in millimeters. So for example, if you're using a 20 millimeter lens, divide 500 by 20, the results you get are the slowest shutter speed in seconds that you could use before your stars would show any streaking or any blurring. Now, if you're not using a 35 millimeter full frame camera, we need to find the equivalent before we do this math problem. So like um, if your camera has a crop factor, 1.4, 1.6, we want to do that, that multiplication first so that we're calculating what the lens would be on a full frame camera. Uh, the same for the mirrorless folks. Uh, mirrorless folks, usually we basically double it. Uh, but, but this is the thing. When you, when you go to most night photography lectures, read most night photography books, you'll hear about this 500 rule. But I believe this rule is not a rule. I believe it's a rough guideline. So what I like to do is do a little subtraction. I like to make my shutter speeds a little bit faster than the 500 rule would suggest. And so basically what I teach folks is if your lens is longer than 24 millimeters, take your 500 rule results, subtract about five seconds. If your lens is shorter than 24 millimeters, subtract about 10 seconds. And that guarantees that we're not going to get any motion blur in our stars. So I have a little chart here uh, and, and I'll, we'll do some simple math. 500, millimeter, 500 divided by 50 millimeters. Let's say we were using a 50 millimeter lens. That would give us 10 seconds. If we subtract away five, just to be certain, the slowest shutter speed I could use is a five second exposure. If my shutter speed is slower than about five seconds, about, I'm gonna get some streaking, some smear to my stars. Now the point here is that the wider your lens, the slower the shutter speed we can use because the field of view gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So the relative motion is that much smaller compared to what the lens is seeing. I said with a 50 millimeter lens, the slowest shutter speed I think I can use is about five seconds. But if I use my 14 millimeter lens, I can get away with about a 25 or 30 second exposure, no problem. Uh, that's a question. Sure. These are the slowest shutter speeds you can use. Should you use them or should you use one that's a little bit faster? Like, do I use 25 seconds for the 14 millimeter or do I use, uh, you know, 20 seconds? But in the case of 20 seconds, you would only be costing yourself light. Uh, much like the aperture ring, uh, a frozen star is a frozen star. W once we've stopped the motion, I mean, to, to take it back from night photography to daytime photography. When you have somebody pedaling by on a bicycle, if you shoot at a 500th of a second and you stop the motion of the bicycle, visually, what's the difference between 500 and 1,000, right? Frozen is frozen. Once there is no motion blur, there is no motion blur. So if you lower the shutter speed even further, all you've done is cost yourself light. And I think that's going to hurt us at night. So we want to find basically the, what I would consider the slowest possible shutter speed. And then there is no reason to, uh, to go any faster with, with one exception. If you have something shooting across the sky, like the Aurora, like a meteor, like a satellite, something faster than the stars, then we might use a faster shutter speed. But if all it is is stars at night, find the, the slowest speed, subtract a little just to hedge your bet, and that's where you set the camera. And we can set that basically before dark. So, so we could say, you know, if I'm using my 14 millimeter lens, before dark, I'm going to set it to the widest aperture, thereabouts. I'm going to set it to about 25 seconds. Those two settings are set. The only setting that I can't set in advance is the ISO because the ISO is the sensitivity to light and that's going to be a guessing game. If we're outside on a night with lots of moonlight, we might be able to use 
a fairly low ISO. Fairly low here meaning 3200, 6400. If we're out there on a dark moonless night, we might need a much higher ISO, 6400, 12,800, on and on and on. ISO is the guessing game part of this pinpoint star um, technique. And that's where the histogram comes in because we've already set our shutter speed and we know that if we go any slower, our stars might be blurry. We've already basically, let's say we're at the widest opening our lens. Well, we can't open the lens up physically any wider. If our images aren't bright enough, the only choice we have is change the ISO. Now, of course, I'm sure your, your listeners know that the higher the ISO goes, the more noise we get. And that's true. But noise is something we can fight against with software when we get home. There is no software to make a blurry image crisp, right? Like if you bring me fuzzy, blurry streaks, I cannot make them back into pinpoints but I can fight noise, and I'll show you how in, in just a minute here. Uh, but this is basically all it takes to shoot uh, pinpoint stars. Just real quick for a little composition advice, um, I think it's essential to have a foreground. If all you show are white dots against the black sky or blue dots, we don't have any sense of scale. We don't know what it is. So when I'm shooting my star photos, I'm always looking for an interesting shape or something at the horizon uh, that, will, that will fill up a tiny part of the frame, but let my viewer compare the majesty of the heavens to the, the shape of something on Earth. So like here I have um, Grand Canyon cliffs at night compared to a big field of stars. And that little black zone gives us a sense of scale, a sense of Earth versus sky. I like to use buildings and, and man-made objects. This is under a full moon. Um, so we have this old schoolhouse here out on the prairie to compare to our stars. If you add a little light to your foreground, this is a camping photo. There's light, there's a campfire, there's a light in a tent. It fills the foreground with color and, and interest where otherwise the foreground might just be inky black. Uh, the same, uh, I've got an aurora shot here um, to fill the frame. Well, the aurora is adding some color. The aurora is always gorgeous. But I went and photographed over a lake, this is in Glacier National Park, because the lake is reflective. So the lake is doubling the color at the bottom edge of my frame. Would, another, you say, would you say in most of these shots you've got about less than a third of, the, of a horizontal frame with the foreground element? Yeah, unless your foreground is well lit and interesting, the purpose of these photos to me is to show the scale of the night sky. So keep the foreground really small in the frame, uh, especially if the foreground is inky black. The, the darker the foreground, the less of it we probably want in the frame. Just a hint, just enough for scale. Um, but when you have, you know, like this time I have uh, some trees up in the Arctic and the Aurora, I teach an Aurora photography class uh, in February. Um, when you have the, you know, the Aurora and the stars, we can get away with a little bit more silhouette because the eye can look at the silhouette and say, oh, that's the shape of a tree. Um, well, here. So once we've mastered our pinpoint stars, then we can do some more fun stuff. We can start slowing the shutter down. And in this case, we're going to intentionally create blur. We're going to make an arc rather than a frozen dot. For this one, our exposure is going to last for minutes or hours where with our star trail, with our pinpoint stars, our exposures were in just seconds. But since our exposure is going to last for minutes or hours, we can lower the ISO again, right? There's no reason to shoot a one hour exposure at ISO 6400. You don't need that ISO. You'll get your light over the hour, set the ISO back down to 100 or 200, something low. Um, now here, You'd asked about the long exposure noise reduction jam, uh, which is a great question. When we shoot really long exposures, we tend to get hot pixels. We tend to get this sort of obnoxious spots in our photos that the long exposure noise reduction can fix for us in camera. So I like long exposure noise reduction when I'm shooting, say, a 30-minute exposure. But there's a catch. The catch is if it's a 30-minute exposure, 
And then the camera has to shoot another 30 minute exposure to compare it, the dark slide. That's one hour before I can click the trigger again. And that's a lot of standing around in the dark. It's hard to stand there for an hour doing nothing. Plus, there's always the danger that the camera battery is gonna die. If you don't have enough battery for one hour, what happens if it conks out at 48 minutes? You got nothing, right? Yeah, so the bummer. trick that, I, yeah, it's a totally a bummer. So what I suggest to folks is that you don't start by shooting 30 minutes. Start by shooting one minute. See if you like it. Shoot five minutes. See if you like it. Shoot 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Build your way up. And when you find the length of time that you love, change batteries. Put in a fresh battery. Then turn on the long exposure noise reduction. And then you can just let it run. Uh, so here, I'll show you, uh, I'll show you a couple of uh, examples of this. Uh, this is a 108 minute exposure, basically an hour and, hour and 40 minutes. Uh, big concentric arcs of the stars over the sky. This is uh, the aurora and uh, arcing stars. This is about 25 minutes of exposure. The difference here being that my ISOs are back in that 200, 400 range. Um, this is a 40 minute exposure uh, at ISO 200. And when I shoot these, I'm careful to compose either towards Polaris, the North Star, or uh, you know, I, I either want Polaris in my frame or I want it just above my frame so that the arcs flow through the frame and not in weird directions like out the sides. All of these have that concentric circle thing because they're all basically aimed at stellar north. I have a question uh, about the foreground, David. Um, in your photo right there with the home, the, the old cabin, the and old there is some, yeah, there's some foliage and some swings. Seems to me the foliage and the swings could move over the course of time with wind. Does, what, what do you do about that? Do you just wait till a very still night? Yeah, in this case, I was blessed that it was a, you know, a very still night. Um, and yes, uh, too much foliage, you get sort of the shivery, blurred trees effect. Um, but since the foreground is largely a silhouette, uh, basically these are inky black foliage, I don't think that's a make it or break it for me. In the photo you're asking about, Jan, I did some light painting. I took my flashlight and I painted the side of this building. That's what's illuminating my foreground. I think, uh, uh, I think we, you know, nights with less wind are going to make this easier. Um, but I don't think, I don't think it's going to make or break your photo if the arc of the stars and the sky is colorful enough. That's where most people's uh, attention is going to go. Their vision is going to go in the frame. That's the dynamic part. So a little bit of blur. If I was to zoom in, I bet there's some blur to these grasses in the foreground but I don't think your eye cares because they're the inky black silhouette. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, uh, just a quick example here of how I shoot these. Uh, this one is a one minute exposure, ISO 200 F28. Again, I'm at F28 because basically that's as wide open as my lens can go. I'm at 200 because with long exposures, I don't need that high high ISO. I need it for the pinpoint stars where I can't get away with a slow shutter speed, but I don't need it for the long stuff. But at one minute, nah, I don't get much arc to the stars. There, there's a streak, but it's not really what I would call a cool streak. At five minutes, there's a better streak to my stars, eh, but still not a fascinating streak. At 10 minutes, the streak has doubled from what we saw at five. Now we're getting better. And at about 20 minutes, I really like the arc that my stars are getting. So with each one of these, basically I extended the shutter speed, extended the shutter speed. When I get to 20 seconds, or 20 minutes, sorry, in this case, uh, that's, when I, that's when I change batteries, turn on the long exposure noise reduction, away we go. Now, what I've been showing you here is the old school method of star trails. Um, the doing it in camera with a single frame. Um, but there is an alternative. This is part of why I think learning pinpoint stars is so helpful. The alternative is to shoot pinpoint star photo after pinpoint star photo. One, the next, the next, the next, without moving the camera, without changing any of the settings. 
Because what we can do when we get home, if we have a sequence of photos, is we can process them, and then we can use software to stack them together. They call it star stacking. And we'll create the blur, the arc of the stars, using one frame, then the next frame, then the next frame. And we can do this in Photoshop, or there's some specialty software uh, to put this together for us. Are you prepared to show us how to do that? That would be great to see. I would love to, but I just have to add one more thing here. Sure. If, if you're going to stand out there in the dark and shoot 100 photos where you push the trigger, wait 10 seconds, push the trigger, wait 10 seconds, push the trigger, you're going to get tired, frustrated, and you're going to make the camera wiggle. So this is the kind of place where an intervalometer or, again, that trigger trap thing is kind of mandatory. We need the camera to fire and fire and fire, and we don't want to touch the tripod. Uh, well, here. Me, I do uh, have a question. Of the two methods, um, the stacking or leaving your shutter open for a long time to get star trails, which do you prefer and why? Ooh, this is a tough question. Um, on the one hand, I prefer the single frame in camera because one, uh, when I get home, I only have to process one photo and it's done. Uh, also, I like the long exposure noise reduction thing. It makes for a really clean 30 second or 30 minute, I guess I should say image, 20 minute image. Um, and I can't really do that with my pinpoint stars. Again, if you turn on long exposure noise reduction, let's say it shot 10 seconds, then it waited 10 more seconds. Well, there would be a big gap when we go to stack them together. So it's a trade-off. The other, but, but having said that I like the in-camera method, there's a frustrating part. And the frustrating part is when airplanes fly through your photo or the camera battery dies and you get nothing. Or you get a photo full of airplane trails and that just is obnoxious. So if you do the star stacking method, let's say you've been shooting for 10 minutes and then a plane flew over. Well, you can take all of those 10 minutes worth of frames, stack them together before the plane emerged. Or if your battery dies after 38 minutes, at least you have 37 minutes worth of individual frames to tie together. So it's, a, it's totally yeah. a trade-off. And then now I may really be getting myself in trouble here because I don't know about this. But if you had the individual frames, doesn't it give you other options to do other things like time-lapse video? It does. That's the same frames that I'm going to use for star stacking are the exact same frames I would use for a time lapse video. Um, so learning to shoot pinpoint stars and then using the intervalometer to shoot one after the other really opens up a tremendous uh, set of possibilities. Um, uh, pinpoint stars too, the same for a nighttime panorama shot where you shoot, pivot the camera, shoot, pivot the camera. There's all sorts of things we could do once we can get a single crisp photo of the night sky. Terrific. Good well, now you know this show is about processing, and so right. we've been talking about shooting, very important in this case. So show us a little processing now with your star trails. All right, give me a second here. Let me uh, screen share Lightroom if I can. Uh, and I believe what David is going to show us is how he does the, um, the stacking. Is that correct, David? Yeah, let me process a single image, and then I'll show you how I stack these together. Uh, just Great. so that it makes sense, uh, I showed an image earlier of uh, stars over the Matterhorn. Um, and let me just get this one out of the way. We'll, we'll skip Old Faithful for now. So here's a single frame star over the Matterhorn. This is uh, 13 seconds, F3.2, ridiculous ISO 12,800. And I had my camera set up with the intervalometer so that it fired this frame and then immediately shot this one and then this one, and then this one. And as I'm clicking from frame to frame, we're seeing like the slightest bit of motion uh, of these stars from one to the next to the next. So here, let me process these. Uh, let me just set them into the right order. There we go. Um, so let me process one of these. Come on. Um, so basically, with our nighttime photos in RAW, we're going to want to do most of the same things that we do with a daytime photo. So like camera calibration to give us a better starting point. Lens repair in Lightroom to get rid of some of that vignetting, some of the uh, geometric distortion of the lens profile. Also, a lot of times at night, it's hard to see, but we might have a lot of fringing. Let's see if I 
turn off the chromatic aberration. Uh, hard to see on the screen, but we tend to get some chromatic aberration. So we'll do the camera calibration, we'll do the lens correction, and we'll do basically the stuff that, that as you said, everyone else on this show would, would do in the basic panel. We'll push the blacks, we'll push the whites, the shadows, the highlights, and really we're just trying to bring out those stars. Now, I happen to really like the tone curve. I think that there's a lot that we can do in here that gets neglected. But with a little bit of cleanup, we would get to something like, uh, we'll say something like this. I'm not going to do a precise job here. You know what comes to mind is uh, it, the, it, where you were adjusting the blacks and whites. If people don't know, there is a new, there are two new sliders in all of the local adjustment tools, the adjustment brush, the radio filter, and the graduated filter that allow you to adjust whites and blacks. So now you could do this, for example, just on the sky if, and leave the foreground um, without those, adjust, those whites and blacks adjustments or have different ones on the foreground. You, you can indeed. In, in fact, the, the setting that Jan is talking about are these new whites and black sliders, say, here in the graduated filter. And just to show um, on a photo like this, I would generally use the graduated filter, at least in my night photography. I like to make the top edge of the sky a little bit darker and a little bit more saturated. I'm overdoing it here on the, on the broadcast. But I like to make the sky fade to darker as we look higher up in the frame. Um, but the big one with our night photos is going to be noise. And so let me just zoom in here, and we'll go to the Details tab. Uh, when we work on these night photos, we know that at ISO 12800, we're going to have a lot of noise. And there are lots of programs out there that can fight noise. I think Lightroom is really good at the colored noise. Let me zoom in just a little further. And let's see if you can see all these false red and green dots. Yes, you can. Uh, that's the colored noise. Now, I haven't changed a single setting yet in Lightroom. But when I enable its defaults, so much of that color noise just drops away. Let me flick this light switch on and off. That the default setting in Lightroom for color noise reduction is pretty darn amazing all the time. Now, if it wasn't enough, I could certainly mess with these sliders and kick it up higher. But the one that Lightroom doesn't fight automatically on its own are these black speckles, what they call the luminance noise. So I'm going to use the Alt Option trick, uh, Alt on a PC, Alt Option on a Mac. I'm going to click on the luminance slider, and that's going to make the photo go black and white. It makes it much easier to see the luminance noise when we get rid of the red, green, and blue stuff in the photo. And I'll just slide that noise slider up to something about like that. Um, and now for comparison, uh, colored noise and luminous noise, much cleaner. Now noise and sharpening, they go hand in hand. So if you do one, you probably want to carefully do the other. Uh, something, something about like this. So now if all goes according to plan, I should have a cleaner photo uh, with less noise. Uh, and in fact, the one you're seeing on the left there isn't right. Hang on one second. Um, this is what it should look like. There we go. Uh, so there's the noise free, uh, uh, no less noise on the right, more noise on the left. Now, if I was going to really polish up this one photo, I might go to Photoshop. I might use other software like uh, my favorite is Nick uh, Define 2, but Topaz. There's all sorts of noise fighting software out there. But the point was to show that I have this sequence of frames, this one, this one, this one. They're all basically the same, the same settings. So what fixes one of them? One of the beautiful parts of Lightroom is I can go and copy those settings. And I'll copy all of them for now. I can then paste all of those settings onto all the other frames because whatever fixed the first one ought to fix all the others. And then just like that, you'll see Lightroom makes all of them, uh, one by one by one, look just like the first one. So here, uh, what I'm going to do basically is bulk image developing. Develop the first, copy and paste to the last. Then I would take these frames, if I'm going to make this into a star stack, and I would export them. Because sadly, Lightroom can't tie these frames together on its own. These days, Lightroom can do HDR internally, it can do panorama internally, but it still can't stack up our star photos. 
So, so what th I let me ask you a question about that. What if you uh, use the open as layers in Photoshop command from Lightroom and then allowed Photoshop to align, you know, use the auto align in Photoshop? Would that do the trick? You could, and then you could use the lighten blending mode. Um, and in fact, uh, Russell Preston Brown, Dr. Brown, he has a script for the Adobe Bridge called Dr. Brown's stack o -matic. Uh, and it, that's what it does. It opens a whole stack of files as layers. It sets a blending mode. It has some other cool features too. But that, that is certainly, for those who have Photoshop, certainly a, a very powerful way to do this. Um, and doubly so if you then want to mask in, say, a foreground. Having each one of these as a separate layer in Photoshop, let's say, let's say I had done some light painting on one of these. I could then use a mask so that the light painted foreground appears at the bottom of my star stack. But, but for those who don't have Photoshop or those who want a simpler way, we take our processed files from Lightroom and we spit them out. Now I've spit out a whole stack of little JPEGs here, but you can use JPEG, you can use TIFF. And what I'll show is that this is just one after the other, image after image after image. And right now if I flip by on my keyboard, Hopefully it looks like sort of a really stuttery time-lapse movie. It does. All right. Well, again, these are the same frames I would use for time-lapse, except in time-lapse I have to crop them to fit uh, video dimensions. Okay, in this and case, can, uh, go, ahead, uh, go ahead and then I have a question. Oh, uh, in this case I don't have to crop them. Um, okay. But for video you'd have to crop. Anyway. So, so I have a question, question. Sure, these, please. Are, these are exported from Lightroom as JPEGs. Is that the best idea? Well. I mean, theoretically, TIFF would be a higher quality uh, result, um, but it would take longer. So for today's demo, I went with JPEG uh, just to keep things moving fast. Got it. Um, so there's this free software out there. And again, Photoshop can do this, uh, but there is free software out there like a program that I like called StarStacks, S-T-A-R-S-T-A-X. And it's uh, donationware, and it works for both Mac and PC. And what we do with StarStacks is we guide it to a folder. So in this case, I'll go to the folder with all my exported JPEGs, and we tell it to open the stack of frames. And then we pick our blending mode, and this is basically just like Photoshop. We would pick one like Lighten, or this one has a mode called Gap Filling. Because remember, I shot photo after photo after photo, but there was a little lag in between each frame. And if that lag was too long, my star trails would look kind of stuttery. Uh, so this has the ability to try and fill in those gaps. But for now, I'll just pick light and blending mode. I'll hit the process button. Let me see if I can make this bigger on the screen for you. Um, let me zoom in a little, because I think this is just so cool. Uh, hopefully, Jan, you're seeing this at, uh, at a good size, I hope. Yeah, it looks great. All right, so watch this. I'm going to tell it to take each frame, and like you said, it's just going to layer them and blend the lighter part, the, the stars, from each one. And when I hit process, it will literally start creating star trails right in front of us. Now, uh, there's our star stack. Yay! Now, unfortunately, I picked one where a plane flew through. Oh, uh, this set of straight lines with the little red lights, that's a plane flying over. Rats. No, but that's good to see, so we can see what it looks like. Uh, here, I'll, I'll run the demo. I'll run the demo one more time because I think the way it stacks it up is just so neat. Uh, we'll, we'll take our frames, we'll tell star stacks to process them, and just like that it builds us a star trail. Yeah. And then of course I would save the results, um, bring that back into Lightroom, and there we go. Fantastic. Now, do you have, if you were to bring that to Lightroom and then take it from Lightroom to Photoshop uh, with like Edit Original, um, mm -hmm. would you see layers in Photoshop? No, not if you use StarStacks because StarStack made you a flattened image. Right. Um, so again, if, if you're, you know, if you're Photoshop savvy, uh, working this in Photoshop, open as layers or using Dr. Brown's Stackomatic script gives you far more control. In fact, like that plane that flew through, if I wanted to, and I don't, but I could go and spot that plane out on each and every individual frame so that when I stack them as layers, there's no plane, right? Like sure. remove, 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 remove. I don't want to, uh, but I could. And then if you do it with Photoshop, do you have to go to the light and blend mode on every single one of those 20 layers? Mm -hmm. And okay. that's where Dr. Brown's script is so wonderful. 
Uh, I mean, like so many things that we can thank Russell Preston Brown for, uh, Dr. Brown's script was taught to take the frames, the raw files from Bridge, open them into Photoshop as layers, and set the blending mode for you. Fantastic. Uh -huh. I hope it works on the newest Photoshop, Photoshop CC 2015. Have you tested it? I have not. Um, uh, but that's a good question. I'm afraid I have not tested it. I don't see why it wouldn't, um, but I don't quote me on it. Okay. Wow. Oh, my gosh. We learned so much. That is so fantastic. David Marks, you are some kind of genius, I'm telling you. Oh, no. Now you are because you get it, number one, which is hard, and then you can explain it, and it's terrific. Now, if people want to learn more from you, and I know you have more to teach about night photography, about uh, time-lapse photography, and about landscape photography in general, as well as many other subjects about processing and so forth, where can they go to learn more from you online and offline? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, first place I would steer you is to my own website. Uh, David, davidmarks.com, M-A-R-X. Um, at my website, you'll find uh, tutorials on Lightroom and Photoshop. I have tutorials on like the star stacks that I showed. I have a whole video tutorial on it. Um, you'll also find out about my workshops. I have a workshop coming up on the coast of Maine uh, where we'll talk a little bit about night photography. I have a Yellowstone and Winter class coming up where like that old faithful photo. And then my big night photography one each year is my Aurora, uh, my Aurora class up at the edge of the Arctic. So that'll be next February. Um, and basically, uh, we don't talk about anything but night photography for a week. Uh, and that's just uh, the Arctic at night is so amazing. Uh, but at my website, davidmarks.com, I have tutorials, I have a newsletter, I have articles and videos. Um, and, and for, those, uh, for those who don't know, I also teach with my friend Mark Johnson. I do video tutorials with him. Uh, I know he's been a guest, a guest of yours over the years, uh, over the months. Um, and then I teach at the Arcanum as well for those who want uh, personal, personal instruction. Fantastic. So many avenues to, to work with you and to learn from you. And I really appreciate you coming here and, and showing us this great um, inf giving us all this information about night photography and showing us how you process your stacked um, sequence of pinpoint images. Really great. Thank you so much, David Marks. Anything more you want to tell us? Um, we got one more minute? You have one more minute. All right. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, the same technique makes, like you said, for time lapse. And uh, let me just see if I can re-screen share for just a second here. Because um, I thought... When you, when you asked about a demo, I thought, well, maybe they'll like this one. Uh, this is the exact same photos that you saw as a star stacks, uh, but this is them in motion. Um, hopefully, hopefully dancing slowly across the screen. Oh, it's beautiful. It looks like snow almost. Oh. Sorry. So what we're looking at now is a video. A video. Yep. And it's the same. Uh, same images, spit out of Lightroom at a different size, stacked together using Photoshop or uh, uh, a video compiler. Learn pinpoint, learn pinpoint stars. There's so much you can do with them. Maybe you'll come back and show us the time-lapse uh, tutorial as well. Uh, I'd love to. That'd be great. Well, I hope that everyone enjoyed this. And if you did, that you'll come back next week for another terrific episode of The Fix. This is Jan Kabili saying goodbye for now from TWIP The Fix. Mm -hmm.